We've been looking at this theme of being unstuck from the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, uh, we've been seeing that's uh, kind of a cyclical thing. Well, today we're, we're going to be talking about getting out of the treachery rut. Now, I'm going to be doing a lot of reading today from the Scripture, and uh, it would be great if you brought your Bibles. That's going to be our campaign next year. Now, bring your Bible every single Sunday of the year, your own Bible. Look up the passage that we're talking about and marking it up. Uh, you might as well mark it up because then when uh, you pass on, you leave it to somebody and see everything you left for them. All those wonderful treasures in the Bible. But we're going to talk about getting out of treachery rut. Uh, I do have to announce this too. Uh, this is a R-rated sermon uh, for violence. If any of you have ever read the Old Testament, you know there's some pretty violent passages in it. Uh, this is R-rated for violence. Uh, the, all, there's also some spiritual things going on in here. It's the first of the R-rated ones. It, it's going to get worse as we go through the book of Judges. I just want to give you a heads up now. There's a little violence in this sermon today. So the question is, what is treachery? What is this thing called treachery? It's deceiving someone who trusts you. It's like a trusted friend that stabs you in the back. Did you ever have a friend turn on you? When you really trusted them, it's not only did they stick it in, they didn't spun it around a few times. It really, really deeply hurts. There was a synagogue in Pittsburgh that felt it was in a trusted community and trusted other American citizens who came into the doors of the synagogue and was received warmly, would have been, as just another Ah, guest and visitor to our, our, our synagogue. And then he unloaded and wound up. That's treachery. That, that is treacherous. We're going to find a similar treachery in the passage today. I'll get the word treachery out of the text because in the middle of our passage that we're looking at, it says the citizens of Shechem acted treacherously against Abimelech. Abimelech. Now, we haven't met Abimelech yet in our, our study here, but in the middle of the text, it says they acted treachery. They stabbed him in the back. Now, there is a mistake to being treacherous. You say, well, what's the mistake to being treacherous? It's very simple. Proverbs 22, 8 says, He who sows wickedness reaps trouble. All right? He who sows wickedness reaps trouble. And the rod of his fury will be destroyed. In Proverbs eleven eighteen, 18, it says just the opposite. He who sows righteousness reaps a reward. I got the reward there being a crown, okay? This is my figures, okay? The one's getting stabbed in the back. You stab in the back, you'll be stabbed in the back. You build up somebody and you're going to have a great reward. Great reward. In the book of Galatians in the New Testament, it puts it this way. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Wow. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Now to our text today, I want to give a little background. A little background. Abimelech is the son of Jeroboam. Now you might remember from last week that Jeroboam is the name that Gideon got because Jeroboam means he contends with Baal. He said, let Baal take care of himself. If he can't take care of himself, then why should you kill me in behalf of your God, Baal? All right? And so because nothing happened to him for tearing down the, 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 the statue of Asherah and Baal and overthrowing his altar, nothing happened to him. All the residents of the town said, his name is Jeroboam. He contends with the gods. He fights the gods, and he's able to be victorious. Well, Gideon had a son by the name of Abimelech. Now, i got to back up to the previous chapter in order to catch what's going on in the context here. The Israelites had said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your sons and your grandsons, because you have saved us out of the Midianites' hands. Okay, you saved us from Midian. Because Gideon rescued them, they said, now we want you to be our king. We don't have a king. All the other nations have a king, but we don't have one. Will you rule over us? And Gideon says, I will not rule over you, nor will my sons rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. You see, the way it was set up, the Lord was in the tabernacle, and the tabernacle was in the midst of the people, and, and the Lord was the king. 
And Israel didn't have a king because the Lord was the king. And he's saying, no, you're not going to put me up as a man as the king. Uh, you, you've got the Lord as the king. But you're going to find he kind of says that a little tongue-in-cheek. He's really flattered. It feels good. They, they want him to be their king. So Jeroboam, the son of Joash, that's a Gideon, went back home to live after he had done all this conquering, and he had 70 sons. You say, whoa, you see, we got our 15th grandchild with us today. Number 15 is here. Diane just took him back and into the, the toddler area because he's two years old. I can't imagine having 70 sons. You know how many grandkids he had? Holy tamale. That's a lot of grandkids. I'm sure he did not remember all their names. <laughs> 70 of his own. Oh, here's why. For he had many wives. Besides his wives, he has a concubine. Later we're going to find that she is a slave girl that he has in another town, uh, I think to hide her away from all the other wives. I don't know, with 70 wives, you think there's a little competition going on there? I don't know, but I got a feeling there's, there's something going on. There's this dynamic that he also has a concubine who's not really, really married, he's not married to her, but he's got a contract relationship to a slave girl that he owns, and she bore him a son and he named him Abimelech. Abimelech. Well, then Gideon died. No sooner had he died than the Israelites again began to prostitute themselves with Baal. They left the Lord God, the true and living God, and went after their idolatry, and they also failed to show kindness to the family of Gideon for all the good that he had done to them. Now, we're going to come to the part where treachery is sown. It's sown. It's sown in a name. It's such a little thing. I already mentioned the name. Abimelech. Abimelech. It's actually a nominal sentence in Hebrew. You know, like the Indians would name somebody running water. Right? That's kind of like, it's a descriptive thing. Well, his name, Abimelech, he's the son of Gideon, but his name is a, a nominal sentence. The Ab means father, the E, the Abi, Ab Abimelech, means my, my, I put it there, my dad. Melech means king. Gideon named his concubine son, okay? My dad is king. So what does that make Gideon? King. So when he told the Israelites, oh no, I don't want you to make me the ruler, that's really tongue in cheek. Because when he's away from the main family, he's over at his other little family, you know, with, he says, hey, my dad is king. I'm the king. I'm the king. He wanted that prestigious position. And Gideon is kind of a complicated character, kind of like most of us. Don't we uh, admit that, oh, we love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, all our mind, with all our might, with all our strength. <gasps> and then what do we do? We enthrone ourselves as God. And, God, I'm not going to do that, what you want me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I make myself my own king. Make myself my own king. There's a little treachery sown in this name. That's all I'm saying. And Abimelech uh, has a little treachery that he's going to be sown in the family. Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, went to his mother's brothers in Shechem and said to them and to all of his mother's clan, got away from his dad's clan, he's on his mom's side, and he goes there and he says to them, Ask all this, the, the citizens of Shechem. That's where, where my mom's family's from. We're not from an Abiezerite over here in Abiezer. He said, well, no, no, we're, we're over here in Shechem. And he says, listen, which is better for you, to have the 70 sons of Jeroboam, Gideon, to rule over you, or to just have one man? Remember, I am your flesh and blood. They're not. And so he says when the brothers here re, he repeated that to all the citizens of Shechem, it says they were inclined to follow Abimelech because he is our brother. So there's a little treachery being sown in the family here. And so the Shechemites gave him 70 pieces of, of silver and uh, he went out with the 70 pieces of silver and he hired reckless adventurers who became his followers. And as soon as he had them, he went to his father's house in Ophrah, and on one stone, he murdered his 70 brothers. He murdered them. 
That's why I said the Bible's a little R-rated. If this, if this were a, uh, made into a movie, it would get an R rating for violence. He is treacherous. He's killing his own half-brothers so that he can be the supreme ruler over the land. But Jotham, the youngest of Gideon's, Jeroboam's sons, escaped by hiding. Then all the men of the citizens, uh, all the citizens of, of Shechem and uh, Beth Milo, they gathered beside a great tree in the pillar, uh, at the pillar of Shechem to crown Abimelech king. Oh. Just as Gideon had said, your name is my dad is king, the son becomes the first king. He's a renegade king. He's a false king. He's not the anointed king of the Lord. He is the king of the people. He's really the king of his own treachery, treachery, treachery. So in a parable, it's going to talk about this treacherous guy. When Jotham was told about this, he climbed up on the top of Mount Gerizim and he shouted to them, listen to me, citizens of Shechem, so that God may listen to you. One day, the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves. You already get the picture? This parable is about, oh, Abimelech is now declared to be king. He said, one day the trees went out to anoint, them, to anoint the king for themselves and said to the olive tree, be our king. But the olive tree answered, should I give up my oil by which both gods and men are honored and hold sway over the trees? Next, the tree said to the fig tree, come and be our king. But the fig tree said, replied, should I give up my fruit, so, the, so, <clears throat> so good and sweet, to hold over, or sway over all the trees? Next, it says, the tree said to him, said to the vine, come and be our king. But the vine answered, should I give up my wine, which cheers both gods and men, to hold sway over the trees? You get the picture? Nobody wants to be the king. Finally. All the tree said to the thorn bush, the thorn bush, come and be our king. The thorn bush said to the trees, if you really want to anoint me king over you, come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, then let fire come out from the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Obviously, he's saying, Abimelech is the thorn bush, and you're going to take all of your, your comfort in the shade of this thorn bush. He's not even a tree. There's no fruit. There's no oil. There's, there's nothing in him. He's a thorn bush, and you're going to gather around him, and fire is going to come out and get you. He says, now, he's making the application to his parable, and he says this, now, if you have acted honorably, in good faith, when you made Abimelech the king, and if you have been fair to Gideon, Jeroboam, and his family, which he was not, if you have treated him as he deserves and you think that my father fought for you, risked his life to rescue you from the hand of Midian, but today you have revolted against my father's family, murdered his 70 sons on a single stone, and you have made Abimelech the son of a slave girl, the king over Shechem, because he is your brother. He said then, if you have acted honorably and in good faith, may Abimelech be your joy and may this be his joy too. But if you have not acted honorably, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume you, the citizens of Shechem and Bethel, uh, Beth Milo. And let fire come out from you, citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and consume Abimelech. He's saying, let fire come out and destroy every one of you, all of you. Then Joseph fled. <laughs> he ran like crazy. <laughs> and he lived in Beersheba, or uh, Beer, and he lived there because he was afraid of his brother Abimelech. Treachery has been sown. In a name, in an act, in murder, in a parable, treachery is sown. It's sown. Sown. Well, the Bible says uh, a man gets whatever you reap, 
Whatever you, whatever you sow, I should say, that you will reap. Whatever you sow, that's what you reap. Whatever you sow, that's what you reap. And so he reaped from God a God-sent conspiracy. After Abimelech had governed Israel for three years, for three years, God tolerates and puts up with what had happened. And then it says, God sent an evil spirit. Whoa, if that doesn't grab you. God sent an evil spirit. It's not that the evil spirit didn't want to go. He already wanted to go. You can believe in that. But God, in his providence, where he is running and controlling and operating his entire universe, God sins. He allows, he takes the restraints away. So this evil spirit goes, and this evil spirit that God sent goes between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem who acted treacherously. All of them did. They all acted treacherously. And God says, well, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. You have sown evil. Oh, I got this evil spirit. Then I'm going to let him work between the two of you. And what does this evil spirit work? This evil spirit all right, all of a sudden my clicker stopped, you guys. Let me just see if I've... All right. Good. There we go. What's that? That was treacherous. That was... Tre That's always embarrassing. I don't know if you're about treacherous. <laughs> <laughs> but not only did God send... God, God sent this conspiracy. And it says in the very next verse, God did this. If you, you can't miss it. God was allowing, you, do, you did wrong? Here are the consequences of what you did wrong. They are coming back on you. God did this in order that the crime against Jeroboam, Gideon's 70 sons, by shedding their blood, might be avenged. Remember those verses, both Old Testament and New, it says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So that you don't have to, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. God is doing this. It says God did this so that he might avenge the uh, Bimelech uh, for what he did to their, his brothers and the citizens of Shechem who supported him in doing it. Who had helped him in the murder of his brothers. In opposition, he was opposing. God sent out opposition. You know, sometimes you, you've got a conscience and you've done something wrong and circumstances in your life are really going awry and all of a sudden there's a link between what you did wrong and you said, you know what? I think God might be doing something here. Not always. You know, Job didn't do anything wrong when everything befell him, all right? But in this case, the text is saying, yes, you've sown evil, evil's coming back. You, you've been opposed to God and Gideon, his judge, and now there's opposition that's coming to you. It says, in opposition to him, the citizens of Shechem, God is causing strife to take place within in the community here. The reason he's doing that, he says here, these, the men of Shechem set up men on hilltops and ambush, and they robbed everyone that was passing by. And, and the people of Shechem are doing this so they can point the finger at, at Abimelech and say, you're not doing your job. So he's causing turmoil in his mother's side family. It's going on. There's turmoil. It's happening. It's just at this time, a guy by the name of Gael, Gael comes along, and he moves into Shechem, and his citizens put their confidence in him. He's a braggart. And Gal says, who is this Shechem guy anyway, or this Abimelech guy? Who is this Abimelech, uh, and, and who is Shechem? I mean, that we should be subject to him. Uh, isn't, isn't he really Jeroboam's son, uh, Gideon's son? And he's not a Shechemite. Uh, why are we subject to him? And isn't Zebul his deputy? Is it, isn't the leader in the town, the city there, isn't he in cahoots with 
with Abimelech? And he says, hey, sir, don't they serve the men of Hamor? And shouldn't you serve the men of Hamor uh, and Shechem's father? Why, why in the world are we, we serving Abimelech? So he's asking all these questions. He's stirring the pot all against Abimelech. Abimelech. If only the people were under my command. Oh, no, he says, what's going on? Abimelech now has got a rival. He's saying, if only people were under my command, then I would get rid of him. I would say to Abimelech, come out. Call out your whole army. Come on out. Let's fight. Let's do this thing. Well, Zebul, the deputy, okay, he's also the governor of the city, he now leads a conspiracy against him. You see how complicated this is going? Everything starts, one thing is a problem, another thing's a problem, another thing's a problem, and instead of things getting better, everything's getting worse. When Zebul, the governor of the city, heard that Gaal, the son of Ebed, said, he was very angry and undercover sneaking. He sends a message to Abimelech, and his message says, hey, Gaal, Hey, he says, Gael is stirring up the city against you, Abimelech. Now then, during the night, you and your men come and lie in wait in the fields. And in the morning at sunrise, advance against the city. And when Gael and his men come out to go against you, do whatever's in your hand. Fight them. Take them on. We've got kind of a little civil war going on in the town here. So Abimelech and all of his troops, they set out by night. And they took a concealed position near Shechem in the four different companies. Now Gael, the son of Ebed, uh, had gone out and was standing in the entrance of the city gates just as Abimelech and his soldiers came out from their hiding place. It's kind of in the, the dawn of the morning. And, and he says, oh, look, the people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. So at that point, Zebo says, oh, no, no, you're mistaken. They're just shadows from the mountains in the morning sun. And he says, no, no, you're mistaking them. And then he says uh, a little bit longer, he says, oh, look up again. He says, look, the people are coming down from the center of the land. And a company is coming from the direction of the soothsayer tree. It's at this point then that Zebul says, where's your big talk now? You who said, who is Abimelech that we should be subject to him? Aren't these, men you, aren't these the men you ridiculed? Go out and fight them. And so they go out and fight. And so Gal leads out the citizens of Shechem. Oh, the Shechemites are being led by Gael against Abimelech. They're fighting their own family. There's this problem going on in Shechem in the family there because these are his brothers, Abimelech's brothers. And there's this fight going on. And, and Abimelech is attacking the city that he's supposed to be representing. This is crazy stuff. And Abimelech chased him. And many of them fell in the flight. And Abimelech drove Gael out of Shechem. And then the next day, Abimelech pressed and attacked against the city itself until he captured it and killed the people in it. Then he destroyed and scattered salt all over it, and the citizens in the tower of Shechem went into the stronghold in the temple of El Barith. And it's at that point he no longer is attacking the city, but he's after this mob of people. And when Abimelech heard that he ordered the men that were with him, quick, do what you have seen me do. Do, do to all, he says, all the men, cut down branches. And so they did, and they piled them up against the stronghold, and they set it on fire. And the people in the Tower of Shechem, about a thousand men and women, also died in the fire that went on. Oh, my goodness. This guy, treachery, treachery, treachery. Because whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. That shall he also reap. The next day, Abimelech went to Thebes, and he besieged it, and he captured it. And inside the city, however, there was a strong tower to which all the men and the women and the people had fled. And he's going to do just like he did before over at Shechem. They locked themselves in the door, and they went up on the rooftop, and Abimelech went to the tower to storm it. And as he approached the entrance of the tower to set it on fire, boom, a woman dropped the upper millstone. I got the millstones there. That's pretty heavy, but you could pick that thing up. The one that it's on, not the lower millstone, you're not picking that up. <laughs> but she picks up the, an upper millstone. Obviously, she had one up on the tower so that they take the grain up there and they could roll it around, crush the grain, and make the flour out of it. She takes the, the upper millstone and she drops it over the wall and it falls on his head. It cracks his skull. Hurriedly, he calls to his armor bearer. He says, draw your sword and kill me so that they can't say a woman killed me. <laughs> Are you kidding me? 
This guy is one arrogant, treacherous, mean, nasty, evil person. And he has been doing evil, nasty, treacherous stuff. So his servant ran him through and he died. When the Israelites saw that Abimelech was dead, they went home. That's the remaining verses. The treachery is ended. Thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech had done. Oh, God repaid the wickedness Abimelech had done to his family by murdering his 70 brothers. God also made the men of Shechem pay for all their wickedness. All their wickedness. When the Shechemites gave him 70 shekels of silver to get the ruthless men to go murder, they were involved in what he did. We've got to be very careful of what we endorse and who we endorse. We have an election coming up. Who are you voting for? Whoa. If they're held accountable for the vote they cast because of what that individual done, we need to be very, very careful in who we vote for. In who we vote for. The Bible goes on in the next verse, it says this. The curse of Jotham, son. The curse of Jotham, Jotham the son of Jeroboam, came on them, Abimelech and the Shechemites. Remember what he said in the parable? If you have not acted in good faith, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume you. That's exactly what happened to the, the, the people in the Tower of Shechem. Fire came out and consumed them. And let fire come out from you, citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, uh, uh, Beth Milo and consume Abimelech. Well, it wasn't a fire, but I'm sure it felt like one when that big millstone hit him in the head. God says this, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, that was Abimelech, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the spirit, from that spirit will reap eternal life. Wow, that's powerful stuff. That's powerful stuff. I know what some of you are thinking. I've known some pretty nasty people, and they seem to have gotten away with a lot of, lot of nasty things, and it just seems like nothing ever goes wrong their way. There's payday someday. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in our body, whether good or bad, good or evil. There's payday someday. All the accounts will be settled. So the question becomes, what are you sowing? What are you sowing? What are you doing? That's the question I'm going to leave with you today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, here we are about to take of the Lord's Supper at the communion table. And you've told us in the scriptures to examine our hearts so that we don't take of these elements in an unworthy fashion. Lord, we have to examine our hearts. What have we been sowing? Maybe I've been sowing some evil of my own, and I will be reaping that. But you have said, Lord, if we confess our sin, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our sins can be forgiven. Lord, we also know that if we sow to the Spirit, we will reap eternal life. And so, Lord, uh, may we change how we sow so that we sow not the evil but the good, not to the sinful nature but to the Spirit. 
May we walk by the Spirit so that we do what the Spirit wants us to do and in the end reap eternal life. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.